you're gonna be dead or in jail by 25. You're gonna be dead or in jail by 25? These were the words my friends and I heard all too often throughout our childhood. These words were said with the hopes of scaring us straight, of terrifying us into defying the odds. Intent versus impact, I guess. But sadly, my friends and I are still haunted by those words to this very day. And it's funny, because if anyone would have even bothered to ask or even taken a look, you could clearly see that I was much more interested in watching Star Wars than being Scarface. <laughs> to a little Jamaican boy filled with hope, those words did nothing but demoralize. They diminished our tragedies, our traumas, relegating our existence to 25 short years. So whenever I work with anyone who needs an even just the smallest amount of hope, I figure a good starting point is to just not say those words. <laughs> well, there's a little bit more to it than that. We begin by acknowledging our pain. We work together to reshape how we feel about our anxiety, our sadness, giving ourselves grace when we feel. And in a world where talking about emotions is considered weak, I sprinkle seeds of hope that there is strength in sharing, that change can occur, and that the brain can be rehardwired. Get over it. Suck it up. Stop being lazy. These are the words that are often said to people dealing with psychological pain. Now, is there anyone in this room who thinks those same words would be said to someone who's just had a stroke, much less a sprained ankle? I think not. There's a serious disconnect in compassion when people are going through emotional turmoil. So for me, the three ingredients for hope are one, the understanding that our traumas and our trauma reactivity are based off physical structures in the brain. Second, that we need to find people who nourish us, who connect and support us. And the third is a cognitive shift where we stop thinking about hope as an end goal or a product that needs to be achieved to finally validate us. The first ingredient I reflect on very often. You see, I grew up in the hood and there were many times, many experiences that left me feeling afraid and less than. But ironically, I've lived in safety a lot longer than I have in danger. And I was so over trauma. So one day at a restaurant, I said to my wife, confidently, you might add, I'm ready to sit with my back to a door. So as we go, I sit with my back to the door. And there's a glass window. And as I look, I could see everyone walking by in the glass window. And as they go behind me, I hear the chime of the door, ding, ding, as people enter. And I'm forced to look. After a few moments, my wife leans over. Richard, stop. You're making people nervous. <laughs> and I said, I can't because I'm nervous. After 10 years from that incident, I still can't sit with my back to a door. But I take comfort in knowing that I'm not defective, and neither are you. The second ingredient comes from robust research that shows that social isolation and loneliness has been linked with premature death across multiple domains. In other words, being alone can kill you. But conversely, finding people who support you, who believe in you, can save. As you've seen from the picture, I was kind of an awkward kid. We didn't have a lot of money. Those thick black glasses, when they broke, I had to use tape. 
I didn't have much, but I had one thing that I found core to me. I was smart. I got good grades. I excelled academically until I didn't. My grades started being bad. I started getting Fs. I got kept back. I was crushed. And that could have been the end of my story, but it wasn't. You see, I had incredible cousins and an aunt who raised me like her own. I had the most wonderful sister and mother who every day told me I was special, who told me that this too shall pass. I had incredible friends. My friends to this day, I think, can't understand how much they meant to me. They picked me up when I was at my lowest. They believed in me when I didn't believe myself. So if you ever find yourself in a dark place, you've lost a loved one, you've lost a job, just know that you don't have to be ashamed and you're not alone. Find people to connect and lift you up. If it's church, find your church people. If it's school, find your teachers. Find friends, find family, find a therapist. You're not alone. The third, this was based off of cognition, which is a fancy psychological term for meaning making. It's how we make sense of things. When I was little, I had a goal. I wanted a wife, a house with a white picket fence. I wanted two children and a dog. And this continued until I met the most incredibly wonderful woman, the most beautiful, intelligent, and caring woman. And as we built our life together, we stopped looking at goals, and we realized that life has no finish line. So as life had its ups and downs, its challenges, its tragedies. We did not see it as a referendum on us. We did not see it as a failure. So life will have its obstacles. But if we're able to understand that we're not defective, that it is a brain thing, that if we could then take that stigma away and find support, find people to nourish us, and be able to change and see and accept the little victories we have. Because remember, even the smallest ember of hope can be fanned into a flame. Thank you very much. <laughs>